so much for joining us. Um, this is the lab tour for civil and environmental engineering. Uh, and we have the one and only uh, Todd Adadero who's gonna um, do this presentation. And he is our lab manager for civil and environmental engineering. And he's gonna show you everything we do. So Todd, if you don't mind, take it away. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Shannon. Well, good morning or good afternoon for those of you that are not out here on the west side of the country. Uh, my name is Todd Atadero. As Shannon kind of mentioned, I am the lab manager here for civil and environmental engineering. Um, just give you a quick background about myself. I am actually an electrical engineer. You may wonder why we have electrical engineers hanging out with civil and environmental engineers. And that is because when we are doing our labs, we are trying to introduce you to some of the latest and greatest technology that is out there. And for doing a lot of experiments and testing, this requires sensors, control systems, a lot of software. And so I'm here to kind of help support you in using this new equipment, as well as making sure it's up and running so that you can actually do your labs. Um, I graduated from CSU in 2002. I spent a lot of time in industry. I've managed civil, electrical, mechanical engineers. And so as we kind of get into discussing what you will see in these labs, um, I kind of have a decent background on why we do some of the things we do. And on top of that, I spent a lot of time in uh, some chemical labs, working in refineries. So I'm aware of what's required to keep you safe while you're in the lab, not only for PPE, but we have a lot of large machines and we like to break a lot of stuff. We want to make sure you are safe and the machines are safe around you. But you're not here to hear a lot about me. You're here to hear about the labs. So kind of what is the reason for the labs? Um, as an engineer, you're going to spend a lot of time in class working with textbooks, sitting in front of boards, uh, deriving formulas, solving these formulas for different idealized cases. Um, but some people learn better by seeing stuff, getting hands-on and doing, not just through working through problems. On top of that, the real world and the classroom don't always line up perfectly. Um, in your classroom, you'll be dealing with idealized materials versus in the real world, you will have stuff that has defects. Um, you will be able to, when you're running experiments, sometimes your results will not be what you expect. And your TAs are going to sit there and they are not going to explain it to you, but they're going to ask you in your report, explain, why do you think your results aren't what they should be? And part of those things are going to be the way you tested it, some of the defects and materials. So it's kind of part of that, getting you to think outside of just the formula in class. And, um, Finally, there's a lot of paperwork to that as well. So in the real world engineering, there's a lot of writing and paperwork that you have to do in your labs. You're gonna to have to do your lab reports as we'll see. And finally, it's just a lot of fun. You get to get your hands on stuff. You get to break things. You get to see how things are actually working. It can be very entertaining. So let's kind of jump in and see what the different labs you may come across here at CSU. Um, the first lab you'll really see is surveying. Um, civil and environmental engineering, it's hard to solve problems without knowing literally the lay of the land. You can't build a structure without knowing how the land is graded. You can't understand why your river or creek is being polluted if you don't understand where the runoffs from the hillsides are coming from. And so we want you to learn how to actually do surveying and get an idea of how that all works. Um, on top of that, with surveying, um, you do have the ability to get internships with like the Colorado Department of Transportation doing surveying during the summer. So it's a good skill to have. While taking this lab, you will learn about different equipment such as theodolites, auto levels, and you will get very familiar with your handy dandy notebook. Um, you will see other more high tech equipment such as total stations, robotic stations, and GPS stations. Let's take a look at some of this equipment. Um, Theodolites are primarily used in land survey. You'll see guys out at, by the side of the road pointing these to another guy that's holding up a stake across the way. Um, they take horizontal and vertical angle measurements between two points. You then have to kind of measure the distance between your theodolite and those points. And then taking your geometry and trigonometry skills, you can uh, calculate angles, distances, uh, elevation changes, all of that fun stuff. 
Um, the other piece of equipment you'll use a lot is the auto level. It is more accurate than the theodolite for checking for kind of the levelness of different areas. Um, it has a hanging prism inside, almost like a plumb bob, if you've ever seen those, that makes sure you get the best level that you can. Um, these will be used primarily, I say, at construction sites when they are laying their foundations and grading your site because you cannot have a building that's off level. You need to make sure that is as level as possible. Finally, your notebooks. As you can see here, there is a lot of information going on. Um, for surveying in all of your labs, you can see here they have maps, they have tables that they're writing in, there are page numbers, there are student signatures, dates, and some of them you will see the weather for that date, temperature outside. All this information is important, not just for you to recreate and design up and build up what you're actually doing, but for other people when you're explaining what's going on, what does this data mean? And so as we get into lab reports for surveying and lab reports for your other labs, it may seem like a lot of busy work when they start telling you, hey, you need a three page lab report that says this, 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 and describes all these information. But when you're working in the real world, your boss, your customer, the construction manager that's trying to work off your designs is going to need all this information to be able to make sense of what you've sat down and calculated. So that's kind of the first lab you see is surveying. Um, are there any questions? I realize I don't have that up. So Shannon, if you see any questions come across, let me know. I will. In the meantime, we will move on to uh, the next class and lab that you'll see. Um, this is a 300 level course, Materials for Civil Engineering. Um, this class has kind of two lab areas that you work in. The first we'll look at is the concrete lab and the second we'll look at is the materials lab. Um, in this concrete lab, you will get a chance to sit down and learn what goes into a concrete mix, uh, the cement that goes into it, the aggregate that goes into it, um, the proportions that you need, as well as you will get a chance to design your own concrete mixes. We like to have you kind of propose and do your own experiments in your labs. And so you may get a chance to say, hey, I wanna design a concrete mix that instead of has river rock, we wanna add rubber chunks to it. So you can mix that up and then we will do tests to see how that handles a load compared to a standard concrete mix. On top of that, we usually have the Colorado Ready Mix Association come in to give you lessons so that you can obtain your ACI certification of concrete field testing, technician grade one. Um, this is a certification that lets you go out and test uh, actual concrete coming in for laying things like foundations. Um, the gentlemen that we'll see here in a second are from the Level and Ready Mix Concrete Company. And when they said when they go out to hire people, they like to see this uh, technician certification on your resume. If you have it, you kind of move to the top of the new hires list. So it's kind of something we like to give our students a chance to get. There is a written portion and a field testing portion for that. So we'll kind of take a look at what you have to learn to do the field testing portion here. So let's see if I can get this video to work. So here they are measuring out the aggregate that goes into their concrete. And then they have a number of different additives that go in. This is air entrainment. We like air in our concrete, especially here in Colorado. When you have your freeze thaw cycles, having air allows your concrete to expand and contract without cracking and destroying itself and get a chance to actually mix it up in our concrete mixers, adding in the cement, the water, and the aggregate. A quick picture of it there mixing up. And once it's mixed up, then we kind of have to pour it out, take a look, make sure it looks okay, and then move on to our testing. So the first set test you are going to see is a slump test. And in a slump test, you have to fill up this cone with your concrete and pack it down correctly. There are rules and regulations on how you do this. Um, so you'll see them kind of showing them how to do this here with the goal of you will practice this yourselves in the labs so that you are capable of doing this in the examination. Um, the goal for this is to see 
if the concrete is still workable once it's come from the plant, not the truck. So once they fill it up, they pull this cone up and we see how far down that concrete slumps. And then we can measure that height change and that gives an idea of how workable it is. The second test is to see how much air is in the concrete. So again, we fill up this cylinder slash bucket. We have to tamp it down again per the regulations. And then it actually shoots a injection of air into the concrete. And then we can, using that, we can measure the amount of air that is inside of it. And again, there are rules on how you do this to do it correctly. You also get the poor concrete cylinders as part of this testing. As you see the cylinders here in our environmental chamber as they cure. And then we'll break them in our concrete testing machine. Some breaks are more exciting than others. This one just had a small break down at the bottom. But we'll see here in another core, they can break a little more dramatically showing kind of the aggregate inside. And using that, we can measure how much force it was required that it could handle and all that other fun stuff. So that's just a quick tour of our concrete lab and what you may do in the concrete lab itself. And next we move on to our materials lab. Um, we lovingly call this the smash lab because here we will smash, pull, break, twist, and do everything we can to destroy materials so that we can learn about their properties. Let's take a quick look here. So we have a number of large systems that we use in this lab that can exert a lot of force. Here's our beam buster for breaking wooden beams. Um, our torque machine to twist metal rods. Um, Instron will pull and crush stuff. And this is our Rockwell hardness testing. This does a non-destructive testing of a metal material. It'll make an indentation and then we can uh, estimate what its tensile strength is but we don't like to estimate all the time. So then we'll put that metal rod into our machine. We will pull it apart, measure the amount of force that requires, measure how far it can stretch, and then break it. Here we will twist metal rods. One side stays stationary where the other side rotates. We draw a black line across the top of it. It then creates this nice candy cane look and let it rotate until it shears. I always enjoy that explosion. Um, this is our beam buster, as you saw before. When you're doing your calculations in class, it's usually with an idealized piece of wood. But in real wood beams, like this, I believe it's a two by six here or two by eight, you'll have knots in the wood beam. So we like to see where these beams will fail, how much force they can take, how much they will deflect. So as you can see here, kind of that knot in the middle, the wood the beam is kind of breaking around that knot. It's a weakness that you don't necessarily see or calculate in class. This is our sharpening machine. It's a weighted pendulum that we use to break metal samples. Um, we will heat these samples up on hot plates. We will put them in liquid nitrogen to cool them way down. And then we will measure the amount of force that's required to break them using this weighted pendulum. And it's just a lot of fun to see things again, explode, break, and make a mess. Kind of back to the wood side of things, we like to show the kind of strength wood has in two different directions. This is parallel to the grain. You can kind of see the wood grain there running up and down as our machine sits here and crushes it. Um, we will use this machine to measure the amount of force it takes to crush this wood and how far we can travel to actually crush it. So you can see here, it kind of breaks along the grain right down the middle. And then the next taste test we like to play around with is we call a uh, perpendicular. Uh, as you can see this time, instead of seeing the up and down grain, we can actually see the rings of the tree here. Um, as we crush this wood specimen, we'll see that it can't quite hold as much force as we could parallel to the grain. And in fact, you'll actually see the wood start kind of getting these shark teeth along the edges where it's actually slipping along the rings of the wood before it finally starts to fail overall. Um, you can stop the test when you start seeing these failures, but 
as I said before, we kind of like to break things and make things explode. So we never stop at the first sign of stress. We let it go all the way. So you can see here, the woods kind of snap through all the rings and finally it breaks apart. So that was a quick tour of our concrete material labs and our materials for civil engineering. If there's any questions, please uh, type them up and Shannon will let us know. The next course you'll come across is the, your fluid mechanics course. And part of that is we have our fluids lab. Um, and here you'll measure a number of different fluid parameters. And let's just take a quick look at what those may be. Um, here you can see the lab that we share with mechanical engineers. Um, we have a number of different pieces of equipment in it. This first one is fluid rotation. Uh, we spin a cylinder at a current rate and the water kind of makes this concave bowl, which you can measure and calculate and see how it compares to theory. Our next is a momentum device. We spray a jet of water onto this plate, and based on that, we can measure how much force that jet of water is actually spraying at. This is our closed flume. Um, we usually use this to measure flow across a cylinder that you can then compare to computer calculations that you do. This is our open channel flume with a hydraulic step. You can see the water is running nice and kind of laminar on one side and then suddenly steps up and is very turbulent on the other side. We like to do rubber ducky races in here just to see how they do. This one gets stuck in the hydraulic, hydraulic jump. It didn't really stand a chance. Um, this is a V-notch weir. Uh, if you know kind of the size of the V-notch and the height of the water, you can actually calculate the flow of water through it. So this is a experiment for you to do that. You have a narrow crested jump here. Um, as you can see, water is high on one side, it drops down on the other with the plexiglass there in the middle. And then the other side of that is a broad crested jump that we'll see here in a second. Um, if you get too much flow going, it is a wet lab, water starts spraying, spraying everywhere. So it's kind of part of the fun you get to have here. But as a broad crested jump, you'll see the chain from high to low is a little more gradual. And again, we have devices that you can sit down and measure this change of water height that you get to play around with. And you can play around with the flows, the angle of attack of this flume while you're in the lab. Um, and sometimes the teams will just have fun and add a couple different pieces in just to see the different flows. So that was just a quick view of our fluid lab. Again, if you have any questions, please let us know. The next 300 level class you will run into is our geotech lab. If you grew up loving to play in sandboxes, this is going to be the class for you. One of our first labs that you'll do here is actually a building sandcastles lab. You may ask, what sand, building sandcastles has to do with understanding geotech or soils. And it has to do with um, water concentrations in the sand and soil and how that will deal with how well it can handle forces. And so you can sit down and design your own experiment to add amount of, an amount of water to the sand, sand, build a sandcastle, and then compete with other students to see who can build the best and strongest sandcastles. Um, there are other things we get to do in this lab. Kind of our first demonstration here is one of our faculty faculty members, Dr. Barather, showing us how to uh, sieve out your soil to break it down to different size aggregates. So here he is filling the sieves and then measuring the sieves out to show the weight of each size of soil. Here is another experiment where the students kind of get to design their own experiment. We want to measure how much water, the permeability of water through your soil. And so they have to design an experiment to calculate that number out. With the idea being you put water on top at either a constant or changing head pressure and then measure the output flow below the soil. Um, this first group is doing a changing head pressure. They wanna measure how long it takes for an amount of water to flow through. Uh, if you're doing a changing head pressure, unfortunately, you have to do calculus and we all, uh, calculus is never fun for some of these things when you can do it a lot easier. So you can do a constant head pressure system where the water level stays the same 
and then you just measure the outflow through the soil. And that is kind of what the students do here to calculate that number out. Um, we also like to build up uh, soil cores. So here we are tamping it down and then getting it out of the mold. Depending on the water content of the soil, they can handle different amounts of forces. So again, using some of the technology we have in our labs, we will put it into our crushing machine and then crush the sample cores. Doing this, we can measure the amount of force that was required to crush these sample cores and the amount of travel it took. Now again, as I said before, you can always stop once you get the number you want, but where's the fun in that? We like to sit down and destroy things as much as possible. So we always kind of go in and crush things and break it. It makes a mess, that's part of the fun. So after the geotech lab, you kind of, after your geotech labs, for those of you who are interested interested in the environmental track. We also have a couple of different environmental labs you can take. Here is a picture of our environmental lab over in the Scott building on campus here. It's a nice brand new lab, lots of stuff that goes on in here. Um, in this lab, a lot of the work that we do has to deal with water quality. And so one of the classes you will take is CIVI uh, 441, Water Quality Analysis and Treatment. In CIVI 441, um, you're kind of measuring a whole bunch of different values of water. So you have total dissolved solids, pH, nitrates, phosphates, dissolved oxygen. You will learn about the different equipment that's required to take these readings, how to use them, what they mean, and what is good for, uh, say, drinking water versus industrial water. As part of that class, you will have a project that you'll have to do. Again, as I stated before, we don't always like to just give you the lab, tell you to go do the lab and show us the results. We want you to kind of design a, an experiment for yourself. So we will give you a situation such as a natural disaster has occurred, um, or you're out backpacking and you're taking some samples from the lake and a bear attacks you. What are you going to do? And then you have to design your own water treatment plant using the material that you may have on site for that. So let's take a look at some of these experiments and what they're doing. Um, the groups you're gonna see, their situation was they're out, they're taking a sample of lake water to measure different uh, contaminants in it. When a bear gets into their camp, destroys their camp, destroys their water filtration, what are they going to do? So their TAs will give them a water sample that is contaminated and they have to design a water filtration system. Um, it'll be a competition among different groups in the lab seeing who can design the best filtration system and who can get the most water recovery. So as you can see here on the left, there is our water sample, very cloudy. There are pine needles in it as large organic particulates, not something you'd really want to drink. On the right is this group's filtered water. Again, still a little cloudy, but at least the particulates are gone. They still have to measure it, and I guarantee you it's still not something you want to drink. So here's kind of some of the different designs some groups have tried. Um, this group had a gallon container. They threw some gravel in, an activated charcoal layer. They had some cotton balls, and then a water collection device on the bottom. Here is how it looks in lab. Again, these aren't the most pretty of designs, but that's kind of the idea is you are doing this in the field. What do you have? What are you going to build? Here is the results they got from their system. Um, on their chart there, you have the blue lines indicating what the untreated water measured out with. The orange lines are how the water was treated. It's graphed on a log scale here, as well as a table. Again, presenting your results, explaining what your results are, are very important as part of the lab. It's not just doing the experiment, not just collecting the data, but presenting those results in a way that we can all understand. Um, some other designs that groups had, this group did a distillation system. So they boil the water out using say a camp stove, collect it with some tin foil and drip it down. There is a cost breakdown of that design. 
And another group, they kind of did a combination of the both. You have kind of a solids, solids uh, filtration up top, leading down into a distillation system and collecting the water there. So the groups all have a bunch of different designs. It's a lot of fun for them to work and try to apply the concepts that they're learning in class and see if they can kind of achieve results that you hope to see. And so those are kind of some of the experiences you'll see in our environmental lab. Uh, any questions before we move on to some of the stuff that you will see at the end of your time here? We don't have any yet, Todd. Okay, perfect. <laughs> You're doing a great job explaining everything. <laughs> Experience. Um, so the last thing you'll do here as, you're, as an undergrad at CSU, getting your civil and environmental engineering degree, will be your senior design project. Um, your senior design project is a demonstration of your ability to solve real world problems. Everything you've kind of done in the lab is in a controlled situation your TAs are giving you your problems. Um, the TAs are kind of explaining to you how to test for those problems, and then you go out, test, and present that data. But now, how will you take those skills that you learned in your lab and apply it to problems where you won't have somebody telling you exactly what to do? As part of your senior design project, you will have access to all the lab equipment that you have used through your career here, as well as a lot of other different equipment that we will see here in a minute. Um, some of it may be like, VR systems as you're doing your design, uh, more complex survey equipment, and some other equipment. So let's take a look at some of the senior design projects we've seen in the past and some of the lab work that you can see that's incorporated in. So this first group was tasked with coming up with a reservoir for the city of Fort Collins. Um, here in Colorado, and especially here on the Front Range, water is very important. Uh, cities are growing, and as we grow, we always need more water. So this group had to go out and find a place to put a new reservoir. That requires using some of our survey equipment, as well as designing a dam to hold that water back. Uh, designing dam is part of your geotech course, and you will look at some of that stuff in your geotech labs. So you can see their dirt, dirt, Earth and dam design here, some of the calculations that they do. Um, they have to do a cost analysis on how much it would cost to actually build this dam, how much it would cost to um, reroute the water. So again, it's a kind of combination of a number of different labs, a number of different classes that you had here at CSU solving a real world problem. Another group had to deal with coastal uh, flooding and tides due to either the uh, rising sea level, as well as hurricanes and other issues. Here they are looking at building different tidal gates, uh, breakwater blocks, uh, levees, storm surge barriers, and they have to come up with a design and plan to protect the coast here out at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Um, they have to do a cost breakdown. They have to apply some of their geotechnical engineering. They have to apply some of their uh, construction engineering, concrete that you may see. Um, on the table here, you can see some 3D printed designs of some of the stuff they were looking at. We have a very nice 3D printing lab here in the engineering building that you will have access to. So if you make designs that you wanna get a physical representation of, you have kind of a access to go and print whatever you need to print. Um, again, there is a presentation side of it and a cost breakdown, things that you will see in your actual engineering career. Another group here, there's an environmental engineering project, Cherry Creek down in the Denver area. They are looking at, uh, say, phosphates, nitrate contamination in Cherry Creek and how to remove those different nutrients that get into it. Uh, these nutrients, if they are unchecked, can lead to algae breakouts, which then lead to the death of your flora and fauna in the creek, and we don't like that. So they were tasked with finding a way to keep the creek clean and clear. They came up with a number of different designs here from a floating treatment wetland to adding new uh, uh, flora and fauna to the creek to consume said algae to doing algae farms where you pump the water from the creek across these algae farms that then take the nutrients out of the water so you can return the water to the creek where it is clean and clear. Again, they have to do a cost breakdown, understand the flows of the channel and understand the amount of nutrients that are in the water. 
So again, kind of taking a number of different labs and applying them to a real world problem. Next, we have a bridge design dealing with, say, floodwaters flowing across it and how to better construct and reinforce the bridges. Um, this will take a lot of your knowledge from when we're dealing with concrete labs. Um, you will have a concrete design class if you so wish to take it. Um, your fluids classes as floodwaters rise and how they're flowing and how they kind of divert around the bridge. They sit down and they take all these measurements and then they come up with a bridge design to deal with these situations. So you can kind of see there in the blue, their actual bridge design, um, some of the concrete and parameters that they are dealing with. And again, a cost estimation, estimation on how or how much it will actually cost to do this. Um, they actually are working with a real bridge um, and they are talking to engineers at CDOT to get an understanding of what's going on. And again, they have a 3D printing of their bridge and the design that they would like to incorporate for this. Again, taking a number of different labs and applying it to a real world project. And this project, again, they are having to take a this building design that was done here at CSU that we want to incorporate into our campus and then figure out where to place it and how to do the grading of the site per Fort Collins requirements. Um, so they have to go out and take their surveying equipment. They have to go out and do a lot of their water flow environmental runoffs. As they do their design, they have to take an account of if it rains on your parking lot, where's the water going to go? Um, if there's any kind of flooding, how do you do uh, water control there? How do we do construction on the site? So again, it's a lot of work taking a number of different ideas and labs and presenting a cost estimation. And you're working actually on something that will go at CSU. Kind of the last scene design project we'll look at here is the CSU Big Beam. I believe this is a competition they do with a number of schools in the Front Range area where they are tasked with designing a big concrete beam, kind of what it says, and then they take these beams down to Denver. Where they have a large beam busting machine compared to our fairly small one here in our lab and they get to break these beams to see the amount of force that it can handle and how they compare it to other schools who do the design here. Um, this will require your knowledge of your materials class, doing your concrete design. You can see they're breaking their concrete cylinders here. Again, there's a concrete design class. Um, there are construction classes. Um, there's some rebar that goes into this. It uses a lot of your basic classes that you take like statics. So again, kind of taking all of that knowledge and all that lab work that you've done, again, applying it to something at the end of your career here. Um, at that point, that kind of covers our lab tour. Got through that maybe a little quicker than normal. Um, let's see here. Okay, we do have a question. For First, something like yeah. the bridge design senior project, what pro uh, what CAD programs are available? Um, I think they do a lot of work. I know we have a class on AutoCAD that we will use. Um, we kind of have access. So you have AutoCAD, AutoCAD 3D. Um, do you know, Katie, do you know what other potential software that you've used? I can think of a few others, but I think they've used them more in building construction instead of bridge design. Yeah, I would say definitely AutoCAD and Civil 3D. Um, I know we do have some software like Revit that allows you to take your designs and move them into a VR uh, area so that you can put on a VR headset and kind of move around that if you want. I know a few groups have done things like that in the past, but I think our main software would be like an AutoCAD, AutoCAD 3D to do stuff like that. We also offer um, uh, an elective course, Civ 305, which is intermediate AutoCAD to help <laughs> learn that stuff. <laughs> yes, there are courses. I mean, we have not just a materials course, but we'll have an AutoCAD course. And you actually have a concrete design course as well that you can take that goes through all the manuals and standards that are required for actually building structures out of concrete 
here in the US. Other questions? Heck, you guys are easy. <laughs> Todd, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I love seeing all of those labs. No problem at all. It's a lot of fun. It's a blast breaking things. It's a blast playing with the tools here, so. Okay. Um, we got a chat that says, thank you, very helpful. So there you go, Todd. Hey, thank you for taking the kind time to come and listen to me drone on. Yeah. Um, so we're ending a little early, which is great. Um, give you guys a little bit more time to eat some lunch before hopefully you are coming back to our 1230 um, session where we will have some actual mock lectures from faculty here at CSU in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, let's see, oh, just a thanks. Uh, so yeah, at 1230, we will have um, a three instructors do a 20 minute mock lectures. So you get a chance to see what it's like to be in the classroom um, and not the lab. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for all of this. And thank you everyone for being here. And we will hopefully see you in about an hour. Okay. Thank you very much, Jenny. Okay. Bye, everyone.